real, didn't it? I know. That's a good thing. Before we go there, the President of the Hall of Fame, David Baker, would like me to ask everybody in the crowd, whoever played one game in the NFL, well, you're all standing, so we got that done. <laughs> Jeez, I didn't realize we had 20,000 NFL players out here. <laughs> He'd like to say that anyone that's had any part of any game or any coach that's had any part you're part of here, but they're building here at the Hall of Fame, but we're seeing here tonight, and that you're always welcome, and you always feel that way. That, that comes from the top. Yeah! Now, go ahead, go back, go, do it, go. seasons as much as Brett Favre. From the warmth of Mississippi to the frozen tundra of Lambeau Field. What mattered was fun. From those with him every day to those of us, the majority of us who got to watch him every Sunday, with the same smile on our face, too. His resume, of course, made him a first ballot automatic Hall of Famer. His Packers of the 90s, Ron Wilkins up here, and Mike Holmgren maybe one day, and those great players and coaches on those teams, they kept going farther and farther and farther every year until they won Super Bowl 31. And in the next Super Bowl, Super Bowl 32. NFL MVP, this young man, three straight years. 11 playoff seasons in Green Bay, one in Minnesota. He did it. He did it. The numbers for Brett Favre, staggering. 199 wins, regular season and playoff. That's ridiculous. All right, overall, here it is, 77,693 yards passing, which, by the way, is over 44 miles. He threw almost 11,000 passes. 508 of them were for touchdowns. But, you know, in my 38-year career, Brett gave me the best answer that I ever got of any question, and I cover sports, football, and other sports. We went through a lot of those milestones. What did each one of them mean? And each one was a thoughtful answer. And then I said, well, Brett, you know, you're also the leader, the all-time leader in interceptions. <laughs> yeah. What does that mean? And without even, it took about two seconds, there was the twinkle, there was a smile and he said, well, then I was trying. Yeah. Yeah. That Monday night game after his dad died, we all saw it. We all saw it. One of 321 straight games that he started, which is, I mean, that's off the charts. Just off the charts. Ladies and gentlemen, to present number four, Brett Favre, into the Pro Football Hall of Fame, his wife, Deanne. I'll tell you what, Brett Favre is the creative quarterback. He just creates plays. Brett would always share his dream to play football in the National Football League. 
He was very convincing, very confident, and there was never any talk about the fame or the fortune associated with being in the NFL. It was just the love of the game. He's exciting for me just to be around. I know he's my son and I'm practicing and everything like that, but I, I know he's, he can do something he's different. Brett Favre's NFL career began as a loan shot from Southern Miss, but his indomitable will and competitiveness soon took center stage. It was just exciting every time he got that snap and dropped back. He played risky. Hey, will you settle down, please? He was always going to do something crazy if it meant he could pull off a win. Goes back to the left. He can run. No, he's still with the ball, and he has caught from behind. free as a bird. He goes out and plays, like they say, the gunslinger. He's that tight. In 1996, Favre reached the game's summit, returning title town to its proper perch. World champion! Yeah! 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 that uh, he was not going to be second to anything. He was going to be number one, and, and he always plays that way. And, and everything, I mean, I don't care if it's golf or whatever it is. I mean, he just can't stand to be number two. To see Brett running around the field celebrating like a child was very exciting for me and for a lot of fans, I'm sure. If a Super Bowl title was the high point, then Favre's emotional performance on Monday night, December 22nd, 2003, following the death of his father, was on another plane entirely. When Irvin passed away, Brad struggled with his decision to play. He knew in the back of his mind that his dad would say, play. His fear was that he wouldn't play well or he would let his emotion overtake him. He wanted to make sure that he would honor his dad's memory. That turned into one of the most spectacular games that he ever played in. I didn't expect this type of performance, but I know he was watching tonight. It was a great moment during such a trying time. He followed unprecedented success in Green Bay and a brief stop in New York with a dramatic final act in Minnesota. Far deep, right side, sinking right, single coverage. Secular stops, completed passes, and victories. Brett Favre's exalted place in the history of pro football is assured. There's talented players, there's players who play with heart. He had both of those, but he also had that mindset that just made him extraordinary. Makes me happy to know that somebody out of my household and the kid that I coach and happens to be my own child has accomplished so much. I am honored to present Brett Favre for enshrinement into the Pro Football Hall of Fame. Ladies and gentlemen, presenting Brett Favre for enshrinement to the Pro Football Hall of Fame, Deanna Favre.
got me wanting to call Ed Werder and spread the word again. But, uh, thank you so much. Thank you. I, I'm not surprised when you're one of the Packer fans here. This is incredible. Thank you, Canton. Thank you, Hall of Fame. Thank you, Jesus Christ, my Lord and Savior. Believe me, I'm blessed. I, I'm an extremely blessed man. I look at my family. Um, what a lucky man. Play a game that I love so much for 20 years to have all the wonderful things happen. What a blessing to share in that, in that joy with you guys here tonight. Uh, what an incredible night. What an incredible week. And having my wife introduce me was an easy choice, considering she was there long before my first touchdown pass. Long after the last. December 18th, 1983, I was 14 years old. My dad took my older brother Scott and I to, to see the last regular season game the Saints would play that year as they were playing the Rams. Now, I was pretty certain at 14 years old what I was gonna do for my future. I was, I was gonna be the next Roger Stallback or Archie Manning or Joe Montana. Uh, but this was the first and only game that I would ever see in person. And if the Saints won this game, they would have made the playoffs for the first time in franchise history. So it was a pretty electric crowd. And as we sat in our seats prior to kickoff, the crowd stood and they pointed in the direction of the Saints tunnel. And as I stood, I saw this long, gray-haired, scruffy-beard player emerging from the tunnel. And I knew then and there, as goosebumps ran up my arm and the hair on the back of my neck stood up, that was what I was destined to do and be. I wanted to be that player. Well, that player happened to be none other than Kenny Stabler. I, I knew, that, of course, I didn't have many choices. It was football, baseball, or bust for me. I didn't have many choices, but I knew then and there that I wanted to be and feel what Kenny Stable was feeling. What an exciting moment for me. The other part about this story that's important is when we returned home that night, what we didn't know is our mother had set up a surprise birthday party for my older brother Scott, who was turning 17. Well, I unknowingly entered the house first to a large eruption of surprise. Of course, it was not my birthday. And as you can imagine, a 14-year-old boy uh, in that situation with all his classmates there was red-faced and embarrassed, and I was looking for the quickest way to get to my bedroom. So as I bolted and ducked my head and made my way through all of our classmates, there was one person that caught my eye, and one person only. Well, it didn't matter. I went and hid my room as I got up the nerve to come out later. That person and I, we played basketball, we, we talked. We played basketball, we talked. And several days later, as we used to say back in the day, we started going again. Well, that person happened to be my future wife, Deanna. Yeah. By far the strongest and most courageous person I know. She's a wonderful mother of two daughters. An exceptional athlete, not only then, but now as she most recently is competing in an Ironman in the next two months. <laughs> Definitely a strong woman of faith. She fought cancer in the public eye. Not only won, but she managed, managed to inspire so many including myself in one way. Yeah. She, 
In the process, she formed her own foundation that has helped countless women in their fight with breast cancer as well. And I'll say this, she's definitely the best looking grandmother I have ever seen. <laughs> As our two grandsons are here, Parker and AJ, and I know they're ready to go to bed and they want Papa to stop talking right now. But I, one more thing about my wife, she was beautiful today. And I'm not gonna say her age because I got in trouble last year in Green Bay to say that. But she's as beautiful today as she was December 18th, 1984. Our two daughters are here. I mentioned my grandsons. Our oldest daughter, Brittany, who is uh, now an attorney back in Hattiesburg. And Woo! extremely bright and beautiful young lady. And I'm so happy she think, takes after her mother. She's, as I said, she's the mother of two beautiful grandsons. But, I see you smiling, buddy. I love you. Her husband Alex is here. We couldn't we couldn't be more proud of. We love Alex to death. Um, we're so thankful that you're here. Our youngest daughter Brayley just turned 17 and just started her senior year of high school last week. And man, I can't believe how time flies. For all of us up here who have children. We find that they they grow up and they're out the house very quickly. And the things that our parents said to us, that we said, yeah, right, Don, yeah, right, Dad. Well, they come true. <laughs> and so, the same things I tell my daughters and have told them. Love them while you can, they grow up quickly. Greeley is an exceptional volleyball player. Uh, she has not made up her mind yet where she's going. Um, and like her sister, she's extremely bright, bright and beautiful. And again, I'm glad she takes after her mother. <laughs> my mother-in-law, who for 33, 34 years has been by far my biggest fan, I have never thrown an interception that has been my fault. According to, <laughs> according to my mother-in-law, I am. We all know her as Momo. She's helped raise our kids. She's lived with us in New York, in Minnesota, in Green Bay. And she's helped raise grandkids, other people's kids, you name it. She's one of the most patient, loving women you'll ever love. Glad you're on my team now. Anyway, as is not alcohol. Anyway, my mother-in-law, who I love dearly, as well as the rest of my family. My sister-in-law, Christy, Deanna's younger sister, her husband Josh are here, and I can't tell you how many times they've helped us and made life so much easier for us over my 20 years of life. So I thank you guys. My mother, who just recently had her hip replaced, and by no means was she going to be put on waivers for this. She was going to be here. She is here. My mother taught me that being there for your children. My mother taught me that being there for your children is absolutely important. I never. Not one time remember my parents ever not being there 
at a sporting event, any school function, you name it. They were always there. We ate dinner together, we ate breakfast together, we rode to school together, we did everything together. And that's something that has been lost in this generation. Yeah. I watched my mother teach special education at Hancock North Central High School for many, many years. And at that time, I didn't appreciate the patience and the type of person that it takes to, to do that type of job. But I learned by watching her and being around her students that treating everyone as an equal and with respect is not only important, but essential. Yeah! Yeah! So, Mom, I say thank you. I love you. Mom was the one who always told us she loved us and was a caregiver. He had to know my father. He was the heavy-handed. Uh, so it was a good blend, one-two punch. But Mom, I love you. Thank you so much. My two brothers, Scott and Jeff, my sister Brandy, they're sitting here in the front row. I think they all would agree. I love them so much. It was it was definitely a fun childhood. We competed. We fought, we ate, we competed, we fought, we ate, we loved each other at the end of the day, and we got up the next morning and we started it all over again. But it was wonderful, and I wouldn't trade it for anything. And I love you guys so much. Thank you. My agent, Bus. I'm always reluctant to introduce him as my agent because it sounds like it's so non-personal and Buss is family. And he's family to not only me, but he's family to my entire family. He's the best at what he does. And he's been like a friend, a brother, a father at, at different times over the 30 years we've known each other. So Buss, I love you. Thank you. And last, but certainly not least, is my father. And I'll tell you, of course, it's been talked about a lot in Oakland game. Um, and that, I'll tell you a, a story. My father would have introduced me here tonight. And Deanna and I, after the game in Oakland, had chartered a plane. Our two daughters had went to Mississippi. She flew out late Saturday night and was there throughout. We had chartered a plane back from Oakland to get Christmas gifts back in Green Bay, take a brief nap, and go to the service in Christmas back in Mississippi. And on the, and let me say this first about NFL fans, Oakland Raider fans in particular. That night, and I have played in Oakland before, and I think everyone here who's played in Oakland, either as the home team or the away team, will all agree they can be downright nasty. I've seen it, I've witnessed it. But I'll say this, that night, the tremendous respect and honor that was shown to me and my family for the Oakland Raiders. And although we didn't ask for it, Deanna and I got a police escort to the airport that I can promise you would have made any president proud. So I say thank you from the bottom of my heart. But on our, our, on our flight back, it was a long flight. As you can imagine, there was a lot of emotions. We had just won the game, and, and it was probably the best game that I've ever played in. That really didn't matter at that point. And we laughed, we cried, we tried to sleep. We laughed and we cried. One time in particular, De Deanna says to me, you had to know my father. My father was short on praise and long on tough love. He, if, he, if he was ever to praise me, I was not to hear it. It was always you can do better. He was always pushing me to be better. That was okay. Never did I hear him say, son, you've arrived. You're the best. 
that was awesome. Great game. It was always, yeah, but. So Deanna says to me on the plane, you know, your dad said to me that he had hoped or could not wait for the day that you were inducted into the Hall of Fame so he could introduce you. And up until that moment, I had never thought about the Hall of Fame. And I mean no disrespect to the Hall of Fame. I say this with the utmost respect for all of you guys. I had dreamed of playing the NFL, believe me. Way more than I thought about my, my schoolwork. I thought about being Archie Manning, running around, throwing underhand passes. I thought about being my childhood favorite, Roger Staubach, throwing it to Preston Pearson or Drew Pearson, handing it off to Tony Dorsett, being Kenny Stabler coming out of the tunnel. I, I thought of those things so many times, but I never thought of the Hall of Fame until that moment. And so a new goal had entered my mind then and there. And I said to myself, I will make it to the Hall of Fame. to the Hall of Fame so I can acknowledge the fact of how important he was. <laughs> this is tougher than any third and 15, I can assure you. <laughs> so I can acknowledge the importance of him my career and my life, which he was a tremendous part of my life. He taught me toughness. Boy, did he teach me toughness. Trust me, there was no room for crybabies in our house. He taught me teamwork. And by all means, no player was ever more important than the team. My father, for those who don't know, chose to run the wishbone which some of you younger generation people do not even know what that is, but it never entailed throwing. But that was the type of coach he was, and that was the type of dad he was. He would never showcase his son's talents or anyone else's talents for their good rather than the team's good. And so, then in there, in that moment on that plane, I was determined for selfish reasons to get to this point, to acknowledge how important he was. I would not be here before you today without my father. There's no doubt whatsoever. And one more thing about my father, and this is something I've never told anyone, including Deanna. My dad was my high school football coach. He's the head football coach. He coached me and my two brothers. But I, I, I never had a car growing up. I always rode to and from school with my father in his truck. And so he was always the last to leave the building because he had to turn the lights off, lock up, and then we made our way home. So it was the last high school football game of my high school career. And although I don't remember how I played before, and I don't remember how I played in the last game. What I do remember is sitting outside the coach's office, say on Wednesday, waiting for my father to come out so we could leave. It was dark. And I overheard my father talking to the three other coaches. And I heard him, and I, I assume I didn't play as well the previous week only because of what he said. And he said, I can assure you one thing about my son. He will play better. He will redeem himself. I know my son. He has it in him. And I never let him know that I heard that. I never said that to anyone else. But I thought to myself, that's a pretty good compliment, you know? <laughs> I, my chest kind of swole up. And I, again, I never told anyone. But I, I never forgot that statement. 
that comment that he made to those other coaches. And I want you to know, Dad, I spent the rest of my career trying to redeem myself. Working on it. I'm trying to get through it. Uh, but I spent the rest of my career trying to redeem myself and make you proud. And I hope I succeeded. Never discount the importance of being a father and the statements that you make. Whether you think your kids here, you're very important to your children. The lesson is we come and go very quickly. So love them each and every day. Now I want to thank some people. First, I want to thank the University of Southern Mississippi. For those of you who don't know, I was offered one scholarship, and that was Southern Miss. And I was happy to take it, and I was determined to prove them right. Jim Carmody, Curly Hallman, Jack White, Rodney Allison, Jeff Bauer, Stephen Maples, coaches that made an impact on my, my college life. I wouldn't trade my four years at Southern Miss for anything. And I'm also extremely honored to follow in the footsteps of one of the greatest NFL players of all time, and one of the, certainly one of the greatest Southern Miss players of all time, and that's Ray Guy. Two coaches in particular that were at Southern Miss at the time that meant more than anyone. Mark McHale was offensive line coach, and Mark was recruiting, recruiting the, the area of the Mississippi Gulf Coast in which I played. And he fought tooth and nail to get me a scholarship, and it came down to the last hour. And when I say last hour, I literally mean last hour. And he fought, and he believed in me, and I thank him so much. He's coaching high school football back in West Virginia. Probably watching right now. So, Coach, I thank you so much for believing in me and sticking it out, for giving me that opportunity. The second coach is a guy who has since passed away. His name is Famous Coleman. And as we called him back then, Famous Famous, was a great guy. And I found out this story, this was a story that Ron Wolf would later tell me after I started playing in Green Bay. He came down after my senior year to watch film, my senior season. And I believe Ron at the time was with the Jets and was looking for a quarterback. And he, after he watched this, this film of my senior year upon leaving the building, famous Coleman said, well, Ron, what did you think? And Ron Wolf said, not that impressed. We said, I'm not sure if you know, Brett had a really bad car wreck right before the start of this season. He lost 34 inches of his intestines. He fractured a vertebrae in his back. Not only was he not supposed to play, we didn't think he would. And he suffered other injuries as well. But he did start four years for us, and I encourage you to go back in and watch the three previous years. Well, Ron Wolf took his advice, went back in and watched the film. And upon leaving, famous Coleman said, well, what did you think? As I like to say, the rest is history. So thank you, Coach Coleman, and thank you, Ron Wolf. And speaking of Ron Wolf, I stood right back there on the back of the stage last year and I watched Ron Wolf be inducted into the Hall of Fame, and I could not have been more proud. Ron Wolf. 
Don Wolf is the single most important person to the Packers rebirth than any other person out there. Player, player, team. It has been almost 25 years since the Packers have had any success when Ron Wolf took over. And since then, we all know what the Packers have done. Without Ron Wolf, Mike Holmgren would not have coached in Green Bay. There would not have been a Brett Favre. There would not have been a Favre, Bashar, a Driver, a Brooks, a Freeman, Shamiro, Keith Jackson, Dorsey Levins, Andrew Bennett, Frank Winters, Santana Dotson, Andre Wright, the list goes on and on. The single biggest free agent acquisition in NFL history is Reggie White. And as I like to say, Ron Wolf made it cool to come to Green Bay. So I thank you, Ron, for believing in me, seeing something in me that others didn't see, probably including myself, and sticking your neck out there for one of the riskiest and craziest trades in NFL history. When you decided to trade a first round pick for me uh, with Atlanta. So I said thank you, Ron. I love you. You mean more to me than me. The man he hired, Mike Holmgren, the greatest head coach I've ever played for. I see him sitting with my good friend Matt Hasselback. We both can attest. He's one of the toughest and most demanding coaches you'll ever be around. He's a true perfectionist, and I'm sure Steve and Joe would say the same thing. But he was a very fair guy, and I know that because could you imagine being Mike Holman and leaving San Francisco? Tremendous success, coaching two of the greatest players of all time, Joe Montana and Steve Young, and getting stuck with Brett Favre. <laughs> Now, I thought I was good, but I had no idea what good was. And I am so thankful that Mike chewed my ass, but believed enough in me to give me another chance. Because there were many times he could have and should have pulled me. And had he done that, there's probably someone else standing here before you talking. So I'm thankful, Mike, for you. For you. Three other coaches, and there were so many other coaches, and they told me eight to ten minutes, and I got every one of these guys clocking me right now. I'm going for a world record. And I don't give a damn. I love you, Chris. I love you. Ken Johnson, the best man in my wedding, the strength coach for the Packers at that time. He's now with San Diego. I love you, Ken. Steve Mariucci is out here somewhere, Boots. And Andy Reid, who was here a couple of nights ago. Those guys could not have been more important at that time in my career. And they were not, they're not only awesome coaches, but they're great guys. I needed a buffer, if you will, when it came to Mike. And quite frankly, he needed a buffer. And there was none better than Mooch and Andy. I love those guys, and I thank you so much for, for believing me and being here for you. And I like Orlando, Coach Dungy, Kevin. I want the guys that I played with to stand up. I'd love to call each and every one of you out by name. And this is college, too. If there's one, stand up. If there's 100, stand up.
Let me tell you, and this may not be a secret, I love playing with you guys. It was a blast. I love carrying you off from the fireman carry. I love tackling you. I love slapping Marco in the ass. I loved it. I loved it. And he loved it too. And for everyone up here, they would all agree that's what it's all about. Not necessarily slapping them on the ass. But loving your teammates, competing, fighting, scratching, tough losses, tough wins. Man, that's what it's all about. You know, I mean, I love it. And I love you guys. The fans. Minnesota, 20 years. Make no mistake about it, I will be remembered as a Packer. be honest with you, I didn't know what to expect as I went back. The last time I walked on Lambo wasn't real pretty. <laughs> so I, I honestly didn't know what it would be like. I do know Packer fans and I know how faithful they are, but I did play for the, the Vikings. But when I walked out on that field, When I walked on the field, I have to admit, 70,000 people, not, not there to watch a game, but to celebrate a career of a player, was absolutely amazing. And you're to be commended for that. And so I thank all the fans across the country, and in particular, you guys. And it leads me to my reflection over my 20 years, and believe me, I had a blast. And I think anyone who watched me play would say that. Sometimes maybe a little too much. But, I, but what I'm most proud of, what I think about most, has nothing to do with statistics. Although, who would have ever thought that a young man from Kill, Mississippi, whose father ran the wishbone, would hold every passing record in the NFL history of one time. Pretty doggone amazing, if you ask me. But but what? I, but I, that's not what makes me most proud. What makes me most proud is how I played the game and being real, authentic, and spontaneous, and loving the game. To me, was what it was all about. I couldn't believe that they paid us and that I was racking up statistics like I was. I was just having fun, and I, I'm most proud of that. And so. When I look back over my 20 years, I can honestly tell you, I can't tell you a lot, but I can honestly tell you that I hold no regrets.